um, are about to happen. So that, that makes me happy that we're all able to be here. Uh, we're hosting these virtual lectures once a month. Please check our upcoming events tab on our website. Uh, our programming right now is scheduled through the fall, so check back regularly. And thank you for joining us tonight. We hope to see you in the future. And thank you because we couldn't do this without your support. Um, so let's let's dive right in for tonight's program. We're happy to be hosting Tony McNichol. Tony is the, and I'm going to get this right, it's a, it's a doozy, Tony, this, this title, but Tony is the Cultural Resources Professional Development Application Reviewer at the New Jersey Pinelands Commission. His presentation tonight is called Remove from Their Natural Ways, the First Indian Reservation at Brotherton, Burlington County, and he will be discussing the establishment of the Brother, Brotherton Lenape Reservation, the Treaty of Easton, the Walking Purchase, and other colonial dealings with Indigenous tribes in the Northeast. And a thank you again to Tony, because I realized before I hopped on that I've been saying Lenape maybe not the correct way my entire life. So um, <laughs> I'm glad to, I feel like I got, I'm already, I've already learned something. So I, I'm excited that we're excited to have Tony with us. We're gonna turn it over to him now. There might be just a second lag as we switch screens here. Um, but, that, no. but I'm gonna hand it on over. Thanks, Tony. Thank you. Let me see here, hold on one sec. All right, can everyone see that first slide there? Yes. All right. Good. Well, thank you. Thank you very, very much for having me. And uh, thank you for uh, taking your evening and, uh, and coming and listening to, listening to me talk. I hope not to ossify you with the contents of this presentation. Um, I'm going to jump right in and, uh, and we'll, we'll get started here. So to talk about Brotherton, you really have to talk about a lot of other things. There's a lot of context. That, that goes into uh, kind of describing why Brotherton happened. And I thought it would be good to just kind of give a, a quick sort of background on how archeologists sort of uh, see chronology and the folks that were the, the precedents for, for these uh, Lenape tribes. So archeologists employ sort of a standard broad brush chronological system for identifying like cultural trends and markers in prehistory. We have the Paleo Indian period, 12,000 BC to about 8,000 BC. Um, the Archaic period, which is from 8,000 to 1,000, and is an early, middle, and late. And uh, the Woodland period, uh, 1,000 BC to about 1600 AD. And uh, that, that ends in, in contact period where uh, colonization occurs. So paleo Indian period, is, it's associated with the fluted Clovis point, which is named after the type site where it was first found in New Mexico. Uh, I believe it was 1920s. So there are distinct regional variations in fluted point traditions across North America, but overall it's the chronological marker for the Paleo-Indian period, the older periods. This particular point was found at the Jersey Shore by a fifth grader, I guess about six years ago on the beach after a storm. Uh, the point exhibits long flakes related to the hafting of the point, and it's usually made of like a high grade stone or a lithic material. This one appears to be uh, chert. So the Paleonian period is generally associated with earliest occupation of the Americas. Um, there are some larger stratified paleo sites in New Jersey, the Plenge site in Warren County. Uh, then there's the Zirt site in Sussex County, uh, though isolated surface finds of paleo stuff is more common. So at the time, at the, it, during the Paleonian period in New Jersey, there's colder climate, sea levels beginning to rise. Um, you would see a pine dominant permafrost and tundra condition. Um, open grasslands, things like that, and the presence of uh, paraglacial features like spungs, which were utilized by paleo groups. So paleo Indians were, you know, definitely big game hunters. And uh, I just, I love this, this image. This is a, a picture of a glyptodont, which is basically a giant armadillo. And uh, we didn't have glyptodonts in the area, but from the look on this thing's face, these two hunters are not going to have an easy time with it. <laughs> it just looks like it's going to be a bad day for them. Um, so as I, I mentioned, paleo hunters are large game hunters, caribou, mastodon, elk, giant ground sloths, bear, peccary, um, though there isn't a great deal of direct evidence in New Jersey for that. 
Uh, also, almost certainly they're fishing and gathering wild plant foods, nuts, berries, hawthorn, uh, fish, you know, and, and they're utilizing fish and whatnot. You can see things like this at the Shawnee mini site, uh, mini sink site in PA. Um, let's go to the next one. So this is a Veracruz Jasper Boulder from Veracruz, Pennsylvania, high quality cryptocrystalline, which just means very, very tight crystalline structure of, of, um, of the stone, which breaks in a predictable pattern. And it makes it very easy to, to create, um, projectile points and whatnot out of this material. Veracruz is just northwest of uh, Quakertown. And uh, you can actually go there. It's a state park. It's a protected park. And uh, these boulders are, are quite wonderful. You can walk through and actually see where people were making tools on the landscape. And the debris from the tool making is sort of strewn about the, uh, the park. It's, it's very interesting. So in the paleo period, you also get scrapers, knives, implements that would have been used for scraping hides, doing utilitarian tasks. And uh, almost certainly they're you know, utilizing a host of perishable materials that just don't show up in the archeological record. So they're likely large mobile family groups moving across the landscape, exploiting different resources, particularly stone materials and utilizing uplands with a clear view of river valleys. And uh, as you probably know, because of glaciers, there was about 100 more miles of beachfront property at the time of the Paleo Indian period. And uh, if you went to the beach where it is now, you would have been able to walk about 100 miles further east. And uh, occasionally artifacts are pulled up in fishing nets or found by fifth graders on the beach that seem to indicate that there were sites out there, larger Paleo Indian sites that are now submerged. So we move into the archaic period. It was further divided, as I said, into early, middle, and late. Um, it looks a bit like the Paleo-Indian period, but you begin to see a wider range of stone tool choices, shapes for projectile points expand. Uh, the climate becomes drier early on, then warmer and wetter through time. Uh, you start to see smaller sites on floodplains and then centered around marshlands. And as time goes on, you begin to see band size groups that are using different types of camps on a seasonal basis. Again, you know, exploiting different resources and probably coming together from time to time, once a year, maybe at least in larger groups to exchange information and trade uh, and likely arrange marriages as well. Um, by the late archaic, the population is increasing. Deciduous forests are in place and you start to see significant differentiation in what folks are using uh, uh, nuts, seeds, shellfish, and um, the hunting of smaller game such as deer begins to predominate in, in that time period. You start to see woodworking implements, stone axes and things like that, and more manipulation of the environment. Uh, there's more evidence of trade networks with exotic goods coming in and uh, groups are tied to local ranges using local materials. You see the development of very distinct mortuary practices like the, uh, the Cohen's Crispin cremation burials at Savage Farm we have right here that was in Burlington, Burlington, County, ugh, Burlington County, just near Marlton. Um, so also by the late archaic, you get the first usage of uh, sort of pre-ceramic technology. You start to get soapstone bowls for cooking, this one here on the left, and, uh, and broad spear points and stemmed point traditions. And uh, again, you start to see the, uh, an increasing use of locally available materials. Woodland period comes, also divided into early, middle, and late. The environment's largely like that of today. And uh, this is where you clearly start to see archaeological cultures with very distinct artifacts and ceremonialism. Um, there is now widespread use of, oh, sorry about that, of ceramic storage technologies like this. Early on, you see flat bottom vessels that sort of mimic the forms you saw in the soapstone vessels of the archaic period. And uh, these eventually morph into different styles with a wide range of decoration and tempers. And there is clearly significant interaction at this time with groups from other regions. You start to see copper from the Great Lakes and you start to see stone like uh, shirts coming down from New York and um, folks making tools out of it down here. Uh, you see copper items in a middle woodland mortuary complex in New Jersey called the Middlesex, where there's likely contact with what you may have heard of the Adena culture out out west in Ohio and Indiana. Um, different types of sites, you start to see base camps, fishing stations, weirs, and again, these mortuary complexes occupied at different times of the year. The late woodland subperiod is characterized in part by larger populations. You get more sedentism in the floodplains. 
And uh, eventually you get the introduction of maize, which is huge for the middle Atlantic by about probably about AD 900 from the Southwest in Mexico. And um, the bow and arrow becomes a predominant hunting technology, although there is some evidence that this probably or may have occurred earlier. And um, late woodland settlements tend to cluster along major waterways. So the point of all of this that I want to get across is that there are complex culturally and technologically adaptive groups of people here living in this region five times longer than the, the time distance between us now and the height of ancient Rome. That's something to think about. Like people have been here for a very, very long time. So when Europeans stepped into this so-called new world, they stepped into a place that had been literally working itself out for thousands of years and uh, has continued to adapt to political and social change in the present day. Um, Europeans walked into a world of innovators, statesmen, philosophers, healers, priests, warriors, and, and leaders. Oops, there we go. So these groups were not the noble savages that were uh, described by Michel de Montaigne or one of the lost tribes of Israel or simply savages indeed, which became the view of those that, that coveted their land. Uh, they were a mosaic of cultures as distinct as any of those that had ever fluoresced in the old world. And the Brotherton Reservation is just one sort of fleeting chapter in that story of continuing adaptation and uh, an attempt at cultural self-preservation by one of these groups that happened to be pulled into the orbit of Europe's expansionist and, you know, one, some would argue narcissistic worldview. So at the time of European arrival, traditional Lenape territory extended from Delaware to New York and from the Atlantic Ocean west into Pennsylvania. Probably the first European contact that we are aware of with Lenape is in 1524 when Giovanni Verrazzano sailed into the Narrows and uh, saw New York Harbor for the first time, thinking from his vantage that this was a huge lake. It's recorded that Lenape boats crisscrossed in front of his ship in a non-threatening fashion with uh, tribal members shouting apparent greetings and uh, obviously intensely interested in getting a close look at these European vessels, which must have seemed quite alien to them. Uh, some estimates are that large villages at this time probably had two to 300 inhabitants. Mm -hmm. um, the Lenape were occasionally referred to by other groups as the grandfathers and their own tradition spoke of a long ago migration to this region from the North and West uh, from the waters where the land almost touches, that's a quote. While there's no definitive sense of where that, that is that they're describing or when it actually happened, it's safe to say that they were here for a very, very long time before European contact. So Lenape means true men or original people, a self-referential that occurs in several other Native American names. They were also referred to early on as the Delaware people, and that was uh, in honor of Sir Thomas West, who was the third Lord Delaware, and he was uh, an early governor of the Virginia colony. So the cultural groups in New Jersey that identified as Lenape spoke an Algonquin dialect and constellated generally around three major groups, the Munsi in the north, the Unami, and the Unlactigo in the south. So early on in contact with the Europeans, the Lenape had cordial relations with the Dutch, but uh, this quickly changed when the Dutch attempted to take more and more land from the Lenape and began to seed the tribes with alcohol, which made them more likely to sign documents they didn't understand. And of course, that usually was to the advantage of the Dutch. So this resulted in events like Kaif's War in 1643, which was precipitated by a Dutch massacre of Lenape and, uh, and also the Aesopus Wars. Kaift was a bit of a sociopath who had been put here as director general of New Netherland by the Dutch West India Company and uh, thought he could cut costs by demanding tribute from the Lenape. Uh, his ideas were not well received, as you would imagine, and so he looked for excuses to pick a fight with them. Uh, starting a massacre of women and children that triggered a series of violent back and forth reprisals for several years. The Dutch West India Company eventually recalled Kaift and he dies in a shipwreck on the way home. Um, by the time of Penn's arrival in 1682, the Lenape had been pretty much decimated by European diseases and war. And it's estimated the Lenape numbered around 10 to 15,000 in 1600. And by the time Penn got here, it was probably only about 4,000 or so that, that remained. Diseases particularly were, uh, were, were a real problem. So there's William Penn, who I'm sure we're all aware of. So William Penn's a prominent member of the Quakers in London 
does some time in the Tower of London for uh, his Jeremiah's against the Church and the Crown. He writes multiple tracts and retractions of tracts while he's in prison. And fortunately for him, his father is Admiral Sir William Penn, who happened to lend a considerable amount of money to Charles II. So to repay the debt and ostensibly get rid of Penn, Charles gave the younger Penn 45,000 square miles of territory in the New World, where he arrives in 1682 at the ripe old age of 38. And we all know about the treaty at Shackamaxon, I, th I think, where, uh, where, where Penn um, engaged in a treaty with the local Lenape. Uh, I grew up in Port Richmond in Fishtown and was captivated by Penn's story early on. You probably know you can still go to this little park, Penn Treaty Park in Fishtown, and uh, see you know, some, some statues that are supposed to be on the site of the original treaty tree. So Penn's perhaps best known for his enlightened attitude toward the Lenape, certainly by comparison of that of the Dutch or the English. He perceives them as children of God, and he treats them like his brothers or family, even going so far as to learn the language within the first year or so after he arrives, so he would need a translator for his interactions with them. Uh, from his own written accounts, it's apparent that he genu genuinely admires them as a people, and his love for them seems to have been mutual. Lenape groups in the 19th century still spoke of their special relationship with Penn, and uh, he made every effort to deal fairly with them, and by all accounts, he was a very reasonable guy. But then there were the sons. <laughs> I don't know if you remember the walking purchase. Uh, walking purchase occurs in 1737. Thomas and John Penn, William Penn's sons, this was their grand swindle of the Lenape. And uh, this is just a, you know, all big part of the context for, for Brotherton, this, the, you know, what's sort of leading up to it. So what many historians now believe to have been a forged treaty was attributed to William Penn for the ownership of as much land as could be walked in a day and a half north of an original land purchase that supposedly occurred in 1686. So the Lenape were convinced of it more out of respect for Penn than anything else for William, the father. Uh, of course, native ideas of land tenure were completely different than Europeans, and ownership of land by one group was completely alien to the Lenape. And uh, even after selling tracts to Europeans, they honestly believed they'd always be able to hunt and fish the land that they sold in per perpetuity. So needless to say, this brought them into additional conflicts with local whites. So the walkers... Uh, begins near present-day Wrightstown, PA. Uh, Jim Logan, James Logan, the Pennsylvania Provincial Cemetery uh, Secretary in League with the Pens, enlisted three European men um, and several Delaware to, uh, to do the walk. The Lenape assumed that a man could walk 40 miles in a day, and uh, they thought it would ultimately be harmless for them for, to, you know, to, to do this. But the walkers fast-walked along a route that had already been cleared by surveyors ahead of time, approximately 65 to 70 miles worth. And uh, they didn't follow the path shown to the Lenape on the original map. So the Pens netted approximately a million acres for the Commonwealth, and it ends in present-day Jim Thorpe, PA, which is ironically named for another Native American who was completely screwed over uh, about 200 years later. Um, so the Lenape, as you can imagine, were very offended and, uh, and met mad. <laughs> so this single action was the catalyst for decades of bad blood between the British and the Lenape, driving them in some cases into the arms of the French in what would become the race towards uh, Western expansion into the Ohio River Valley during the French and Indian War. So to talk about uh, Brotherton, you also have to talk about the Great Awakening because of the, uh, the Brainerds. This is an evangelical tent here. The Great Awakening is a, a term used to describe uh, a rise in evangelical fervor that's occurring in the colonies in Europe in the 1730s and 1740s. It has its roots in Scotland in the 17th century and is associated with names such as John Wesley, George Whitefield, and Jonathan Edwards in Connecticut, who uh, eventually became president of Princeton. So the idea of being born again and being renewed in the spirit and conversion comes out of the Great Awakening. And uh, early on, a focus of the, of the colonial evangelicals is a, a call to act as missionaries to the Native Americans and to kind of bring them out of their, their heathen ways. In fact, Dartmouth College, which was established in 1769, was actually started in part to provide an institution for the training of Native American boys as missionaries who would then go out into the wilderness and convert the heathens, you know, as they were considered. 
Uh, there's some recent research that argues that while the Indian missionary machine was, was immense early on, and unda undoubtedly many Native Americans did in fact convert, um, the actual relationships to conversion were more nuanced. Uh, many may have seen converting to Christianity as a way to ensure cultural survival and also just literal survival. There was a hope that converting would facilitate integration into the white community, and uh, there were concepts in Christianity that, that did resonate with pre-existing native ideas of egalitarianism, for one. And uh, that process in anthropology, we call it syncretism. So I'd also argue that converting might literally be seen as a way of protecting, your, protecting yourself and your family from being wiped out, as many of these indigenous groups had witnessed now for generations. So I think it's important not to think of native groups as passive here and simply surrendering to the greater morality espoused by European preachers. Uh, they were save, trying to save their asses, which, which brings us to David and John Brainerd. So John, who eventually becomes the minister of the, the Brother and Indians after taking up uh, for his brother David's prior, prior efforts. So straight off of the cover of Itinerant Preacher GQ, here we have David Brainerd, Jonathan's older brother. He's born in 1718 in Connecticut to what is by all accounts a fiercely pious and religiously devoted family. From an early age, he's in poor health, sickly, seems the entire family is as well. Uh, Jonathan will struggle later on himself with weakness and ague, uh, which is uh, fevers. So David enters Yale in 1739 and wants to be a minister. He's also befriended by and mentored by Jonathan Edwards, who thinks he has a brilliant mind, pure soul. And... Uh, David gets himself caught in a scandal in 1742 where he's overheard saying that one of his tutors has, quote, no more grace than a chair. So despite his formal apology to the board at Yale, they're unforgiving. They toss him out. And uh, there's speculation that the unforgiving nature of this one incident leads to a schism in the evangelicals. And as a result, Princeton is established. So David's immediately caught up in the Indian mission movement and becomes one of its rising stars. And he initially works at a place called uh, Canal Meek, I think it is, Canal Meek, near Stockbridge. And uh, he then works with the Lenape at the Forks of the Delaware near Easton. He's eventually sent to the Indian village of Crossweeksong, which is uh, present day Crosswicks, uh, where there was a group of about 130, 140 Lenape. There is conflict almost immediately between his evangelical style and the Quakers, who, of course, they pray in a much more austere fashion. And uh, the local white population is just habitually abusive to the Lenape. Uh, this trend continues later on with, you know, with, when they wind up in Brotherton. So in 1746, Brainerd moves his group to about 80 acres near present-day Cranberry. And uh, the community becomes known as Bethel. Most of where we think Bethel was uh, is today bounded by Thompson Park in Cranberry. I don't know if it, anyone's ever actually been there. Um, but within that year, David becomes increasingly ill with tuberculosis, probably. And he retreats back north to Connecticut, living in the home of his mentor, Jonathan Edwards. So in a strange twist during the short of amount, amount of time between him heading north and his death, he establishes this weird love relationship, uh, not unrequited love relationship with uh, Edward's 17-year-old daughter, Jerusha, who apparently contracted TB from David and died herself a few months after he did. So that was a nice parting gift. So David dies in Norwich, Connecticut, 1747. And the letter he writes on his deathbed contains this statement about his Indians, quote, always insist to them that their experiences are rotten and that all of their joys are delusions. So we're going to see the, the kind of uh, pandering attitude uh, that, that folks, even the preachers that preach to them had for these folks. So enter John Brainerd, who eventually becomes the, uh, the preacher at Brotherton, also attends Yale. Probably having learned the lesson from his brother, he manages to graduate without insulting his teachers. Uh, when David dies, there's a vacancy to fill at Bethel, and Jonathan's asked to go there and take up where his brother left off. So he arrives at Bethel in 1747, and he notes, quote, The Indians have upwards of 40 acres of English grain in the ground and about so much Indian corn, and they do, I think, in general, follow their secular business as well as can be expected, considering they have all their days been used to sloth and idleness. 
So Jonathan occupies his brother's old cabin while he's there. He's given uh, several missionary trainees by the Synod to assist him with his work. Um, his brother David had tried to keep the inhabitants of uh, Bethel in a semi-wild environment, a wooded environment, and this was an attempt to sort of ward off the, uh, you know, the, the influences of local whites. So Brainerd obsesses early on over industriousness and believes that this is really the only way to salvation for the Indians. He sees them as childlike, and he's often frustrated with them. Um, this is another quote from his journal regarding his life at Bethel. Quote, I've often been obliged to preach in their houses in cold and windy weather when they have been full of smoke and cinders, as well as unspeakably filthy, which has thrown me many times into violent, sick headaches. While I have been preaching, their children have cried to such a degree I could scarcely be heard, and their pagan mothers would take no manner of care to quiet them. At the same time, perhaps, some men have been laughing and mocking at divine truths, others playing with their dogs, whittling sticks. And this is not from spite or prejudice, but for want of better manners. A contemporary of Brainerd's goes further and says, quote, Indians are prohibited from Christianity by an indolent, wandering, unsteady disposition. So things are not looking good for the, uh, for the one not bay. <laughs> So Indians continue to come wandering into Bethel, trying to escape probably being murdered, raped, or harassed outside of an established community. Uh, but the residents in the area continually plague them and are vocal about being uncomfortable with such a large number of savages gathered in one place. Um, grog sellers show up, uh, whiskey and, and, and ale sellers, and they begin a, a brisk business selling liquor to the Indians. And uh, it becomes a local sport there to see how many Christian Indians one can make drunk. So John Brainerd suggests the development early on of trade schools for boys and girls. And uh, despite this, the town manages with Jonathan at the helm for a while until about 1749, when Robert Hunter Morris, the chief justice of the province, sues the Bethel Indians for possession of their land based on what he claims is a valid land title based on the forged will of a former Indian king. Does this sound familiar? It's, you know, it's the same sort of principle as the walking purchase. So this is around the time when the grasp for land begins to really intensify and um, Indian titles are either outright ignored or they have some sort of legal gymnastics worked on them invariably to the detriment of the tribes. And to top it all off, around this time a sickness sweeps through Bethel, which was almost certainly smallpox, and uh, the neighbors called it divine providence. So there's briefly talk of moving Brainerd's mission to the Susquehanna, where Brainerd does occasional mission work. By 1755, Morris's case is passed favorably through the courts and the Indians are completely evicted from Bethel. Um, there's a very good chance that the onset of the French and Indian War the year before and uh, renewed apprehension about <coughs> Indians in general contributed to the decision. So French and Indian War, seven year war. <clears throat> and you may notice that this does not add up to seven. <laughs> The war starts earlier in the colonies and territories as the British and the French start to jockey for purchase. Um, the war eventually becomes the day's equivalent of a world war between great powers and ends with the Treaty of Paris in 1763, where France winds up giving up all their rights to land east of the Mississippi. In North America, it's ostensibly a battle for control of territory and settlement in these seemingly infinite markets of the New World, beginning particularly at the forks of the Ohio River. Um, where the Allegheny and the uh, Monongahela meet, centered around uh, the frontier French Fort Duquesne. So the British attempt to wrest control of the Ohio River Valley from the French. Washington himself was involved in uh, one of the initial skirmishes in the Ohio River Valley. River Valley. It was called the, um, the Battle of Yeomanville. Uh, the French are heavily reliant on Native American allies and various tribes aligned with either the British or the French. So the British are largely supported by the Iroquois Confederation, while the Lenape, having seen what it gets them when they trust the British, uh, join with the French against the British, along with the, uh, the Shawnee, the Ojibwe, and uh, several other, other tribes. So the native warriors fighting against the British gave them an incredibly hard time. They were experts in guerrilla warfare, experts on the terrain, etc. Um, this led really to the British reaching out to tribes hostile to them, like the Lenape as well as to their Iroquois allies and active mediators. And so they would come together at major conferences like Oswick and uh, the gathering that generated the Treaty of Easton in late 1758. 
The Indians from Bethel in 1755 felt particularly threatened. They scatter, and some tried to make their way back to Crosswicks. Some of the remaining Bethel group actually petitioned the governor for protection, and a law was passed that said that all Indians had to actually register with the province and wear a red ribbon in their hair if they were a friend of the English. So Brainerd, meanwhile, is he's sort of working behind the scenes with the society in Scotland for propagating Christian knowledge and the Synod uh, to try acquiring property for the remaining members of the Bethel and Crosswicks group. And at one point in 1754, there was an effort to secure about 4,000 acres, which, uh, which ultimately failed. Brainerd was officially dismissed from Bethel in 1755 with the reason for his firing explained as his wife's uh, delicate condition and her continuing sort of uh, serial sicknesses. So with the advent of the French and Indian War, the Indian mission movement intensifies somewhat as, uh, you know, worries about New Jersey Indians joining those in Pennsylvania begin to rise. And frankly, the missions become sort of a holding area or camps where natives can be controlled and surveilled. Um, while he's centered at Bethel, Brainerd's also a pastor of a church in Newark, and he's ministering on the fly at multiple locations. Uh, he's even making trips out as, as far west as the Susquehanna River back and forth. He's moving around quite a bit. So in 1757, Brainerd's wife dies and his son and one of his daughters die the following year. And this is about the time where Brotherton appears on his radar. In 1758, both the Crosswicks Conference and the Treaty of Easton occur. The Crosswicks, the Crosswicks Conference results in the uh, set aside of the Brotherton parcel. And um, the Treaty of Easton results in a kind of ceasefire between the British and the Lenape and their allies in the West with the English promising to sort of limit expansion and settlement in the Ohio Valley and West. The minutes from the Treaty of Easton are just unbelievable. They're really, really remarkable. And I recommend trying to find them on, online. It's not difficult, check them out. Um, the treaty notes are a spectacular ex example of sort of the subtle complex diplomacy and bargaining skills of the Iroquois and, and a host of other tribes, including um, Tidieskung of the Lenape. Uh, they remind me of a William Penn quote where he described the Lenape as master diplomats and thinkers. And uh, he always said if, if they had all the information in a particular case, there was no man that could out-debate them. They were just uh, fantastic orators. So the Brethren Reservation is located in uh, present-day Shemung Township. Uh, Shemung meaning land of the big horn. So Oshomo is horn and Ankh is place. And uh, it was originally called Edge Pilak, or the place of pure, clear water. The reservation itself lasted a total of 44 years, not very long, until 1802. And this was the year that the, uh, the destitute band of Lenape that remained there uh, left for New York. So this is the original survey map of the Brotherton Reservation from 1759. And uh, down there on the right-hand side there, it, it's virtually impossible to read right here, but I will read it for you. Uh, the quote is, by overcrowd of affairs, I precipitously marked out the ten houses in ye line of each lot, whereas it should have been in ye middle. The two houses next to ye water, with the adjacent field of about four or five acres, is proposed for ye supply of poor widows only. The above may give ye governor some idea how it lies. I wish I could have done it better. So why was this location chosen? There is a, there's a good chance that, in part, it was chosen strategically to isolate good Christian Indians from the influence of the bad Indians in the wilds during the remainder of the French and Indian War. So out of the Crosswicks Conference comes a proposition from the Lenape to have the tract of land set aside for them uh, in assurance for the renunciation of all their land claims south of the Raritan River. The tract itself is owned by a gentleman at that time named Benjamin Springer, and there is still a Springer's Brook that runs through a portion of the original parcel in, and that's located in uh, Indian Mills. The parcel was originally calculated at about 3,044 acres. And when it's later divided up in 1802, when the Wenape leave it, it's discovered that it was closer to 3,300 acres. So the tract is situated about 20 miles from Burlington and about 15 from Mount Holly. So Charles Reed, the Indian commissioner at the time writes, quote, we have purchased a tract of land for the Indians, extremely convenient for them, about 2,000 or 2,500 acres, and have this day sent a surveyor to survey a parcel of wild natural meadow 
near the place where they can cut their hay and directed him to take up 500 acres of it. They can in a day come from the sea within five miles of this place with clams and oysters. There are 300 bearing apple trees on it and 24 acres of good Indian corn, which we propose to lay down with rye. And this will be their first year's provisions on their removal. So there's a clause also in the deed that states that no one can lease or sell land associated with the parcel and any non-white that attempted to settle or encroach on the community would be forcibly or could be forcibly removed um, by a justice of the peace or a sheriff. Initially, there are about 200 Indians who come to live at Brotherton. In 1759, the governor of the province writes about having gone to Brotherton to scope it out and he notes good soil, large hunting grounds, uh, a saw house being erected and lots of land being cleared for tillage. He also notes conspicuously that Brotherton is decidedly out of the way of communication with wild Indians. So that's uh, definitely on people's minds when they get people moving on to this, uh, this parcel. Money for startup and upkeep almost immediately becomes an issue. I think it started with good intentions in some ways, but you know the reality of things kind of set in rather quickly. And uh, we find several of the Indian commissioners, as well as the uh, Synod, pitching in funds just to get structures built on the site. The inflow of funding will slow down very, very quickly. And uh, in this early period of the reservation, though, a conference with the chiefs indicated they were happy with what was being done for them. But you would say that, too, probably <laughs> in those circumstances. So... Jonathan Brainerd, at the time the Brotherton Parcels purchased, is working as a chaplain for the British Army during the French and Indian War, and he is stationed in New York near the Canadian border. Uh, he's asked to take up the ministerial duties at Brotherton, and he comes to live there in November of 1759. Um, Brainerd early on sort of writes about his hopes for the reservation, quote, I hope to prevent their running 12 or 15 miles to the inhabitants for everything they want, whereby they not only consume much time, but often fall into the temptation of calling at dram houses, where they intoxicate themselves with spiritous liquors, and after some days, perhaps instead of hours, return, return home wholly unfit for anything relating either to this or a future world. Nice. <laughs> One of the first things Brainerd does is he tries to acquire funds for an Indian school on the reservation. This was a big part of the denativizing program of Native American groups and a pretty shameful one. Uh, children were more often than not forcibly taken away from their parents at a young age and shipped off to Europeanized school and uh, indoctrinated into the European educational system as well as forci you know, forcibly converted to Christianity. So Brainerd wanted to establish a, a school there that rivaled one in Connecticut where he had established a relationship with the headmaster and frequently sent his own folks from, from Brotherton North to attend. He comes to Brotherton with the idea that his Indians can finally become completely self-sufficient self here. He also notes many of his group have enlisted in the army and fought and died on the frontier for the British army. And this is really uh, a story that, that needs to be told, uh, Indian veterans of the Revolutionary War. So funding, as I mentioned, becomes a problem early on, and the Synod of New York and Philly attempt to fund projects on the reservation, uh, but you know, that doesn't happen frequently. Brainerd continues to send selected children to Indian schools in Norwich to become missionaries to other Indian kids and, and groups. And we have documentary evidence of some of these children, um, one whose name was Miriam Storr. She was described by Brainerd as an amiable child, savingly converted at the age of three. Like, I'm sure she knew what she was doing when she converted. And uh, Elizabeth Quayla, who was described as a pretty behaved child, but nothing respecting her is in any ways remarkable. And uh, this is actually from a later time, but just to give you an idea of how this kind of progressed, this is the 19th century and the Carlisle Indian School in PA. Um, these are children from the Indian school. The, the Navajo boy to the left, his name was Tom Torlino, and uh, the children on the right were uh, Lakota Sioux kids who were brought back from the plains and, and converted, and as you can see, uh, whitened and uh, Europeanized. So by the 1760s, with funding becoming scarce, Brainerd's actively complaining that the governor hasn't provided him with a house or a church as promised. Brainerd's salary is about 40 pounds a year, and he finds himself using his own money to assist the group at Brotherton when the funds really trickle to a halt. Funding requests that he makes for the reservation are repeatedly shot down and commissioned by the Quakers, who disapprove of Presbyterian evangelical ministering. So in 1762, 1762, the Indians at Brotherton petitioned the Jersey Assembly to have their debts forgiven that they can't pay, 
um, because their mill burned down or was burned down for them, maybe by a, by a local. So Brainerd also begins to minister to poor whites in the area. And again, as he's constantly on horseback and leaving them to their own devices. As a contemporary of Brainerd notes, quote, his position as an Indian missionary was very trying. He loved his Indians too well to leave them, but they were just too few to justify the appropriation of all his time and energies. So Brainerd's spending less and less time at Brotherton and uh, whatever cohesion or protection he might have given that community begins to unravel in his absence. The members of the community are resistant to adopting fully European lifestyles, particularly agricultural methods. And uh, by 1767, the group's already being invited to come out west and live with a group of Delaware uh, that are settled in Ohio. By 1768, Brainerd leaves Brotherton as his primary place of residence and moves to Mount Holly, where he gathers a congregation, builds a church and a house and a schoolhouse, and he settles down with his new wife. Certainly money probably had something to do with it. He was making no money being the minister of, of Brotherton for sure, uh, and almost certainly his health, as he was a pretty sickly guy like his brother and uh, was constantly on the move in all seasons. So Brainerd does appear to have left Mount Holly and briefly gone back to Brotherton in 1775 and uh, largely stayed there teaching to a very diminished group of Lenape until about 1777. The conditions at Brotherton by the 1770s had become pretty precarious without funding. Um, the absence of Brainerd most of the time and the constant harassment by locals. Uh, the advent of the Rev War leaves the Brotherton group even more isolated and with less money. And uh, you add this to the fact that these people are traumatized, just completely traumatized. Just imagine for a moment that an alien culture appears out of virtually nowhere, wipes out an entire generation or more through disease. So, I mean, just simply by showing up and um, then sets to the task of systematically dismantling everything about your culture, family traditions, religion, politics. And uh, if you resist, you and your family are in danger of being just killed outright. So imagine the kinds of concessions you'd have to make to yourself, you know, to your family, the things you'd have to find a way to justify in your head simply to survive. Surveilled in manageable groups, your children taken away from you, poison introduced into your community in the form of liquor uh, to make you more manageable, and uh, basically to reify all the hostile ideas that the other has of you. So trauma. I mean, today we might call it PTSD, but um, I just want to make clear, you know, make no mistake, these folks were severely traumatized. So in 1771, the Brotherton groups living in abject poverty petitions the colonial government to lease some of their land to white farmers to bring money into the community, but they are denied that, that, uh, that possibility. In 1777, a traveler named John Hunt visits the group at Brotherton and describes that he found them in low circumstances as to food and raiment, naked children running everywhere, and rampant drunkenness. This is also the year that Brainerd moves permanently from Brotherton to Deerfield, where he dies in 1781. No one is picked to replace him. There is an itinerant minister named Dan Simon who preached there in 1783 briefly, but he was suspended for immorality, whatever that means. <laughs> In 1795, a journal was published, penned by a German traveler named Johann Ferdinand Altenreich, who visits the reservation in 1794. It's the most vivid eyewitness account that we have of conditions at the reservation near, near its end. And uh, I'd like to read it just because it's such a snapshot of the way things were, and there were not many written records of what was happening there. I'd like to read it. It's a long excerpt. It's a journal quote, um, but it's, it's worth hearing. So... Um, the, land, <clears throat> the land already belonged to the Indians and was less sandy and of better quality than what we had seen up until this point. Nice winding paths like an English park led to the individual residences of the Indians on a tilled fenced in field. Just like the log house standing on it, they were entirely European American in manner, even having fruit trees. Here resided their leader whose name was Skicket or Jacob Skeket who would lead his people to New Stockbridge in 1802. In him, we found a tall, well-proportioned old man with black hair, small blackish brown eyes, and with a complexion that was not coppery red, as seldom was the case with some Iroquois I had the chance to see in Philadelphia, but yellow or mulatto colored, not having the blackish shade present among those. He had some red of old age on his cheeks. His physiognomy did not deviate much from the European one, his cranium was large, the thick brow of his forehead protruded strongly and therefore made the not so large nose appear indented at its beginning. His wife was of the same height. She might have been a 40 year old or more. 
She too had the same complexion, but without the slightest red on her cheeks, shiny black hair, small black eyes, her forehead narrowed upwardly, her cheekbones were prominent, and through this and through her chin, her face in a way had a quadrangular appearance. This Asiatic trace struck me all the more as I already had noticed it in the skull of a Wabash Indian woman. Men never have this feature, but always a more rounded, bigger, more strongly projected in the middle and in the back of their skulls. Soon afterwards, in another house in the neighborhood, we saw a boy of about 13 years old. This one had the same yellow complexion without red color, black hair, a broad face, small black eyes with distinctly slanting close set eyes, like among North Americans, almost adjacent neighbors, the Asiatic peoples. In addition, in the boy's house, we saw two old women of much darker as if smoked complexion. In the same house <clears throat> were two young Indian women who hid themselves upon our arrival so we couldn't set eyes upon them. All those Indians we saw were dressed like white Americans. Even the old man no longer tore his beard out and be had begun to shave his still growing beard in European fashion. We conversed with the principal person who spoke English as all of them did. Their own language is pronounced entirely in the throat like the Germans or the Swiss and it is very rough. This they still use among themselves, by the way. Although he was able to read and write and seemed a reasonable man, his conversation was very poor, though he spoke slowly and only a little, and when not asked, he would simply sit as if in deep contemplation. Already having been far removed from their natural ways of living for so many years, all activities seemed to have died, died away among these Indians. They have begun to scorn agriculture. They often lease their land for cultivation. At best, they weave baskets and make brooms, which they carry to market in Philadelphia. They have entirely forgotten their old occupations. They do not even wield the tomahawk anymore. This lack of mental stimulation and their totally inactive way of life is probably the main reason their numbers are obviously dwindling. Only about nine families are said to remain, among which there is also a family of, a New, England, of New England Indians whose tongue they themselves do not understand and with whom they have to speak English. The whites living at some distance and who no longer see as many Indians as before maintain their younger people desert to the warring Indians of the backlands. Out of envy for their possessions, on the whole, they have a treacherous spite against the remainder of rightful Lenape owners. The land transferred to the Indians for their settlement is called Edge Palak and is said to compromise 3, 000, or comprise 3,000 acres. Except for not being allowed to sell it, they have complete command over it. They can sell lumber and even lease the land if they choose. It does not seem as if they have divided the land into certain allotments among themselves. The common authorities judge their quarrels with whites, their own disputes they do not sue for, and none takes them into account. Many people remember some years ago an Indian whose father had been murdered took revenge in a manner that was law among the Lenape. All of a sudden he took a knife and stabbed his enemy with whom he was drinking in a local pub. He then pursued him as he escaped and knocked his brain out with a stone. They are all nominally Christians. They have a wooden chapel where an itinerant preacher still preaches. We started out again after our Indian and his wife had drunken up the greater part of the bottle of rum with as much indifference as others would have done with a glass of water. I would have liked receiving anything special of some kind from him, but neither a stone ax nor a chisel nor any kind of antiquity was possible to obtain from these people. Neither songs nor even their former war chant did this man know. I only found a trace of an old tradition of their sacrifices with him. At the change of moon, it is said, a long hut was constructed and three deer would be slaughtered around which the people danced. So, unquote. By the late 18th century, the Quakers, who for decades shot down funding for the reservation because of their ideological feud with the Presbyterians, are now starting to make some half-hearted efforts to provide intervention for the folks that are left at the reservation. And by this time, it's not many. In 1796, another petition was placed before the government to appoint commissioners to lease land for the benefit of the Brotherton Indians. And uh, women of the group were actively engaged in selling traditional crafts to bring money into the, into the community. You've probably heard of Indian Ann, um, who was a local resident. She lived there a bit later, but that was what she did. Uh, she, she was a basket maker. Um, <coughs> All of this was really just kind of a case of too little, too late. And at this time, that man that I had mentioned, Jacob Skeket, appears to have stepped up as the head of the group and appears to be the tribal representative. And uh, by 1801, the Brotherton group receives a formal invitation from a Mohican group known as the Stockbridge, who lived near Oneida Lake in New York. And uh, the invitation read, quote, pack up your mat, brothers, and come eat out of our dish. 
Our necks are stretched in looking toward the firesides of our grandfathers until they are as long as cranes, unquote. Many of the Brotherton group are moved by this invitation and they petition the legislature for the, the ability to sell their lands and, uh, and go to Oneida Lake. The commissioners were eventually appointed to divide the Brotherton reservation tracks into lots not more than 100 acres and sell them at public sale with the caveat that three quarters of the remaining Indians at Brotherton had to consent to the sale. So the state government commissioners actually went out to Brotherton to see how many uh, Lenape agreed. And at the time they went out there, there were 63 adult Indians remaining in the community and only 46 were present. 38 signed the petition right then and there and eight additional signed the petition in March in Trenton. Um, even though only 46 signed, which was less than the three quarters required, uh, the governor allowed the petition to go through. And uh, I'll just kind of let that hang there for a second. So in 1802, this, this advertisement uh, appears in regional papers. To be sold, land in timber, pine, maple, hickory, red oak, and cedar, a sawmill in good repair, a good seat where a mill had been, a dam, cedar swamp, orchards, a number of horses, and most land uncultivated. The sale began on the 10th of May, and by August, uh, about half of the reservation land was unsold. Um, the property was ultimately sold to 25 different people at 2 to $5 per acre. And uh, as earlier indicated, the proceeds of the sale were used in large part to hire drivers and wagons to transport the last about, about 100 inhabitants of the reservation, the 275 miles north to New Stockbridge. So... There's one final eyewitness account of their departure, quote, their scanty furniture, their rude relics and treasures, the aged, the sick, and the little ones were packed in the vehicles and the healthy marched on foot, whistling aloud to keep their courage up or in defiance of their painful destiny, the cavalcade moved off from the reservation to the music of violins. So ironically, the group actually camped overnight in Bethel on their way north to New York. And uh, that is my my tale. <laughs> Anyone hear me still? Yes. Yeah. So I just want to follow that up by saying, so I have a couple of minutes here. I just wanted to say that uh, Brotherton is a really important story and uh, it needs to be told. A lot of folks in New Jersey don't even know that, that it had even existed. And, um, one of the things that the commission is doing that I'm, I'm doing is uh, we're doing uh, ground penetrating radar surveys out there. And ultimately we're, we're going to put some, some um, units and trenches in the ground to kind of see if we can find the remainder of probably the houses that were out there and, and hopefully maybe the foundations of uh, the church. So there's ongoing stuff, you know, we're, we're out there trying to, to tell the story. We're trying to find out more about these folks that live there. And, um, you know, very sad story, like, like virtually all stories about Native American contact with Europeans, unfortunately, that they, they don't end well. So. Yeah. That was great, Tony. Um, I hope so. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I think we're also enthralled that there's a, there's a few messages in the chat, but um, I just had a quick question, actually. Who owns the land now? Uh, Shumong Township owns it. Okay, so it's not private. Yeah. No, no, the township owns it. And, uh, you know, we were able to kind of work out a situation with them that, that we were allowed to kind of go in and do the do some testing there. So, but it's it's at the behest of the township for sure. All right, so, um, um, so we have a, a question for you. Um, amazing presentation. And said, can you provide the name of the author of the eyewitness account? Is there a handout? Uh, yes, hold on. I had, it's a, it's a German traveler. Yes, his name is Johann Ferdinand H. Altenreith, which is A-U-T-E-N-R-I-E-T-H, Altenreith. I'm sure, sure I'm mangling that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he was a German, German tourist, a German traveler. The thing that I found fascinating, most fascinating about that account is that they actually came to see this place like it was like a zoo. They brought a bottle of liquor with them, you know. They gave the liquor to the guy to try to get him to talk about things. And it was just, I, I don't know. <laughs> that stuff just drives me up the wall. It's very, very sort of shameful. Yeah. But um, 
Here's another question. Is there a marker uh, in Chemung? There is. Yeah, there's a, there are several markers up and down, up and down the road there that kind of talk about John Brent, where the location of John Brainerd's uh, church was in his house. And uh, there are a couple of markers there that, that talk about the, the Brotherton Reservation as well, where the sawmill was and where the church was, the original Indian church. Um, Try to me there. Um, why don't you stop sharing your screen just so we can see you? There you go. Wait a minute. There we go. There we go. There we go. Um, and I, I asked everybody to mute, but if anybody else has any questions, you can either put them in the chat or you can speak up. Um, I'm just sort of monitoring the chat. Um, the other um, question is um, how many Lenape or Lenape were left at the end when, before, before they moved to, uh, I guess, New York or Massachusetts? Uh, there were, to New York, there were about 80 of them, 60 to 80, like in and around there, which was obviously significantly reduced from when they first came there, you know, which is about 200, 250. And uh, within 40 some odd years, you know, the population had had thinned pretty pretty quickly. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, any, yeah. any questions for Tony? And you know, if anyone has any questions that they they can email me, I can give you you know sort of considerably more comprehensive <laughs> answers yeah. in an email. Here's another question uh, from Maggie: Are there any Lenape left in South Jersey? Yeah, they're. I mean, they're descendants of the Lenape all through throughout New Jersey for sure. You know, they're they're still a viable people, and there are three federally recognized uh, Lenape tribes, um, remnants of, of the Delaware Nation, and uh, so yes, yeah, there are Lenape still okay. in New Jersey. Okay. I totally butchered that word. Um, is there, I mean, was the land always, did you, everybody always know that that was where the reservation had been or is it a recent sort of rediscovery? I think locals know it for sure. You know, lo locals have always known it. And uh, I just think most folks in New Jersey outside of the, you know, 10 mile radius of Indian mills may, you know, probably just had never heard of it. Mm -hmm. um, it was a lost story, really. Yeah, here's another question. Are there books on any of the families? Uh, any of the families, the Lenape families? I'm assuming, yeah. No, unfortunately. I mean, nothing that I can find. I mean, you always hope against hope that in someone's attic somewhere, you know, they're going to find something in an old trunk where, where folks had written stuff down. I don't know how many of these folks were actually uh, literate, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, there's there's that. Um, so, no. I mean, the short answer is no. Okay. Not that I'm aware of, anyway. There's another question. Does your work uh, liaise, liaise, I guess, or liaise with the Lenape or aid them in any way? Um, I actually did uh, liaison with the Lenape for the ground penetrating radar project. I felt like it was our responsibility to let them know what we were doing out there and to kind of keep them abreast of the situation the whole way through. And they're going to get copies of the, you know, the, the data reports and whatnot that, that are produced from the excavations. Uh, when we go out there and do them. So yeah, I was in contract in contact with each of the three federally recognized tribes, you know, as we we're setting up work. Okay, uh, I was going to question, um, relationship to the Pal, I, I know I'm butchering this word, Palatin, uh, I guess, tribe in Burlington County? The, the what, I'm sorry? I, I think the question, um, I think, is this Shamel? <laughs> if you can unmute yourself. Um, what's the relationship to the Palatin in Burlington County, and unless I think that's a tribe. Well, the Palatin, yeah, um, I, in Burlington County. Uh, <clears throat> Hi, sorry. There's like a reservation I went to as a child every Columbus yeah. Day yeah. by the carload, right off of 295. I think it was the Powhatan or something that's tribe right, right there. Yeah, um, they just lost their. I think they lost their land lease very recently, and uh, they were asked to vacate. I, I think. I mean, don't don't quote me on this, but I um, I think they lost their property, and I know that they at one point in time were a state recognized tribe, and I don't know whether or not they still have that status. Uh, the Powhatan were originally, I mean, the, the Powhatan king was basically uh, an Algonquin speaking um, tribe from down the Chesapeake area, Chesapeake region. 
Um, but I don't really know much more, unfortunately, about about the tribe that you're talking about. I know they they were definitely involved in some sort of legal wranglings with the state, and uh, there were some property issues. But beyond that, I'm not really quite sure where they stand. Thank you, Tony. Great talk. You, so if you email me, I can find out some information for you. Um, I'm going to hear something um, from Jody Milton. Check out the book by local author Strong Medicine Speaks by Amy Hill Heath or Hart. Um, Strong Medicine Speaks. Strong Medicine Speaks by Amy Hill Harth. Okay. Public Harth. Um, and Alex Spearcock just put in Rancocas, there used to be an annual pow pow, if I remember correctly. Is that still going on? The pow wow. Um, I don't know. I, I know of that pow wow, but I don't know if it's still going on, to be mm -hmm. honest with you. And I would also recommend if you want to learn a little bit more sort of about the, the details of the, the kind of legal wranglings and whatnot that led up to um, the Brother Reservation, there's a book by a gentleman named George Fleming, F-L-E-M-M-I-N-G, I believe. And uh, mm -hmm. it's the only book that I'm aware of that's uh, specifically about the, uh, the Brother Reservation. And you start to, I, I also would definitely recommend looking at the Treaty of Easton notes which are just spectacular to read, just really, really fascinating. So yeah. um, if you're interested, people. those are all really good sources. Yeah, here's some, uh, someone wrote, my family, claim, my family claims we are from the Lenape tribe, Little Creek, Delaware, and Delaware, New Jersey. Um, Possible. Does anybody else have any other questions? I mean, these folks are interacting, you know, for hundreds of years, so. Yeah. It was fun. I, no, I had no idea, and I've been here for almost 30 years, um, <laughs> but I should have suspected. Um, so um, just to let everybody know, what we're going to do is we send everybody um, an email tomorrow. Um, Tony's been nice enough to give me his contact information, some other um, YouTube videos and other um, uh, presentations and things that he's done. Um, and some more, I guess, some research. Um, and so I'll send that out to everybody. Um, and Tony, you're happy to have people contact you with questions. Uh, or I'd be thrilled to. And, you know, anything you can teach me as well would be would be appreciated. If you've got sources, you know, if there are things that, that you know or, you know, could add to the presentation, I would really appreciate it. So yeah. it's, it's, it's super important to get people's, you know, there's a lot of local knowledge out there that, you know, that kind of fleshes the story out. So, yeah. Absolutely. Anybody um, have any thank other No, thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for participating. I really thank you very much. Thank you. Very, very good presentation, Tony. Thank you. Thank very you, good. I hope you have a great night. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good night, everybody. Good night. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sarah. You too. <laughs> Thanks. Bye, Tony. Oh, bye now. Bye, Tony. Bye. Have a good evening, everybody.